Goodness, you'd think by now I'd have the knack of uh, two screens here, but um, just wanted to give everybody uh, a heads up that we're going to be getting started. Um, my apologies, I was making sure that we were also streaming on our Facebook page for all of our uh, friends on there. So welcome to the conversation, everybody, and thank you so much for being here. It is 7.01, so let's go ahead and get started. My name is Danica Rines, and I am the Communications and Media Relations Manager for Columbia Association. I just want to start by welcoming everyone to this COVID community conversation presented by CA in partnership with the Howard County Health Department. I am so thrilled to be your moderator this evening. As a former journalist, I really do cherish these moments where we can talk directly to experts and really get uh, into the facts and the information that we need to know and with these particular experts, we get to know exactly what's going on in our backyard. So I want to make sure um, we're all uh, appreciating that resource that we have here tonight. So very excited about that. Um, a few housekeeping notes before we get started here. So I just wanted to run these by everybody. So this discussion is being recorded. So just a heads up, that is the case right now. And uh, we are doing that so we can post it later on our YouTube page for anyone who wasn't able to make it here tonight. We're also streaming, like I mentioned, live on Facebook. So hopefully we will be able to get some questions in from there as well, although we have a pretty good turnout tonight. And so we'll be getting a lot of questions here. We'll also ask that you use the Q&A function. So if you're not too familiar with the Zoom webinar here, I'll try to walk you through it. We also have a chat going in case you have any technical difficulties. But if you go to the bottom of your screen, there should be an icon with two little speech bubbles. That's the Q&A function. And what that allows us to do rather than using the chat is really track who has been asking questions and which ones we've already answered. So that's a really helpful, helpful tool for us. So go ahead and type your question into that window send it in and you can actually indicate whether you'd like to be anonymous or not. We'll keep it to first names here tonight, but in case you do want to be anonymous, that is absolutely an option. 
and we'll try our best to answer as many questions as possible. Want to make sure everybody knows too that I'll do my best as a moderator here to combine some similar questions to save everybody some time. Uh, we are going to try to keep this to a tight hour, so as best we can to respect everyone's time. So we may not get to some of the questions here tonight, and I apologize ahead of time for that, but we'll get to as many as possible. All right, quickly, I do want to introduce the panelists that we have here with us tonight. First, Dr. Maura Rossman is the health officer for the Howard County Health Department. She has almost 25 years of experience in public health. She was first appointed to the health officer position in 2012 and has worked for the Howard County Health Department since 2007, serving as medical director and deputy health officer of clinical services. Prior to coming to Howard County Health Department, she served as the medical director for school health for 10 years in Baltimore City's health department. And the first 10 years of her medical career were spent in academic pediatrics as a neurodevelopment, and as a, I should say, and as a neurodevelopmental specialist. So we thank Dr. Rossman for taking the time here. And then Harry Oaken, MD, has been practicing internal medicine in Howard County for 34 years and has been an active faculty member at the University of Maryland, now an adjunct professor of medicine there. He was the chairman of medicine at Howard County General Hospital for 14 years and has served as CA's medical director since 2007. He recently co-authored a book called Boom, Boost Your Own Metabolism, A Guide to a Better Life. Throughout the pandemic, too, the COVID updates he sent out to patients have been forwarded countless times, reaching audiences all around the world. So we want to thank both Dr. Oaken and Dr. Rossman for being here today. And before we get started with them, I do want to give an opportunity to Dan Burns to say a few words. And Dan is actually the newly appointed Vice President of Community Programs and Services for Columbia Association. His career in health and fitness in that industry has been consistently aligned with community impact, moving his way from various manager and director positions to a Vice President of Operations position for Club One in California to independent consulting nationwide. And throughout those years, Dan has had a large focus on serving the nonprofit sector. He joined CA in 2015 as the director of sport and fitness before becoming the vice president of community programs and services last year. So Dan, I'm gonna allow you to say a few words here. Well, I can find the mute button and I can talk. Uh, thanks, Danica. Um, first, let me say thanks to, to Dr. Rossman and Dr. Oaken um, for tonight and all the work they and the help they give us behind the scenes as, as we work through this pandemic. Um, they've been truly instrumental in helping us help you. Um, I want to take a minute to talk about physical activity. Um, a recent CDC study showed that almost 25%, 23.2% actually, of Maryland residents were what they deemed inactive, self-reported as inactive. It's almost a quarter of our population. That is a lot. And besides the obvious reasons of why that's important, particularly in these times, being physically active is tremendously important, um, both from a mental and physical standpoint. Uh, multiple studies have shown repeatedly that physical inactivity is associated with a higher risk for severe COVID outcomes. Um, in a study of studies, done before the pandemic, it was shown that regular physical activity strengthens the human immune system, reduces the risk of falling ill and dying from infectious disease by more than a third, and significantly increases the effectiveness of vaccination campaigns, campaigns that I'm sure Dr. Rossman and Oaken are going to talk about tonight. In addition to the physical risk, there has been a dramatic increase in the incidence of incidences of depression and anxiety during the pandemic. Um, if you were with us for the last conversation, I, I mentioned some of those stats and they're pretty alarming. Um, some research suggests that elevated levels of aerobic activity may be associated with greater reductions in depressive symptoms. Strength training has been shown to reduce symptoms of anxiety uh, for kids. Moderate to vigorous act physical activity and exercise during the day are associated with Elevations in self-esteem, improved concentration, reductions in depressive, depressive symptoms, and improvements in sleep. Um, all things that we need now um, more than ever uh, as we all kind of go through this COVID fatigue, um, both mentally and physically. Um, being active also doesn't mean going to the gym. 
although we more than welcome you at any of our facilities. Um, just being active and moving is so important. Um, you might have to bundle up a little bit now, but we have 95 miles of walking paths and a few lakes to enjoy. Um, make sure you wear your scarf. It is a little chilly out there. Um, we have some videos from some of our awesome instructors on our website um, under the CA at home page. Uh, just chase your kids around. Go to the ice rink. Um, or you can hit the gym. Um, we welcome you. Um, but I just ask that you please consider adding movement and physical activity to, to part of your strategy for maintaining your health during COVID and for the long term. Thanks, Dan. Thank you, Dan. Appreciate it. So moving right into questions again, folks, feel free to throw them into the uh, Q&A function there on Zoom. And um, we're gonna go ahead and get started here with Dr. Rossman and Dr. Oaken. And I am just gonna rip that Band-Aid. There's some big news that came out today out of Howard County, um, uh, the County Executive's Office announcing today that we will no longer be subject to indoor mask mandates. So Dr. Rossman, I wanted to maybe kick it all off with that. Um, and if you could kind of share what brought us to this point after you know being under the mask mandate for um, the few weeks, and I'm sorry, I don't have the exact number. I'm sure it's burned into your head <laughs> as far as how long we've been under that mask mandate now. Well, what I want to say, thank you, Danica, for once again inviting me uh, to speak. And thank you, uh, Harry Oaken, for joining us. And Dan, totally agree with uh, the physical activity aspect of it. So yeah, breaking news, not only Howard County, but a number of uh, our surrounding counties um, have decided to um, forego the mask mandate. Um, this is based on, at least in Howard County, um, and I, I think the surrounding counties as well, as sort of the precipitous drop that we are seeing now in the number of cases. Uh, I think since, I don't remember the last time we met, but since the last time we met, you know, the waves of COVID just keep coming. And we had the significant increase in the Omicron wave post Thanksgiving. And now we're finally seeing uh, the wave come down. Uh, masking is a important, in my opinion, easy and cheap strategy uh, to prevent transmission. Uh, but I also understand that uh, we are reaching as a community significant uh, fatigue in terms of the strategies that we've needed to deploy for, for more than two years now. So given um, that things are looking much rosier than they were six weeks ago, our hospital system is in a much better place. Just a week ago, we remained in a crisis uh, mode for our hospital system, not just in Howard County, but in Maryland, that things are looking better. So. I, I concur that the mass main mandate, particularly in Howard County, not necessary to require people. I live, play, work in Howard County. I know that Howard County residents continue to wear their masks. So I know that we'll continue hopefully to see that. We still remain in a high transmission range per the CDC. So mask wearing is important, but whether or not government needs to require it of us is really the question. And I hope and feel the support of all my Howard County neighbors, friends, colleagues, that we know what we need to do personally. Thank you for that, Dr. Rossman. Dr. Oaken, I wanted to ask you what you have heard, um, not only as our medical director and from our members and our team, but then also on top of that, your patients. And what has been the biggest concern, the biggest question that you've had to respond to in this latest wave? Well, there's a variety of things that have come up. Uh, one of the things I'd like to say, actually, kudos to Dr. Rossman and her team. Howard County has done just a magnificent job in actually being the leader in vaccination. We're 81% fully vaccinated, the number one county for that. And our cumulative case rate is very low. So we've done a great job here in Howard County and um, our hospital has done a terrific job. We're fortunate, although our emergency room has been extremely busy, um, our bed totals related to uh, 
uh, the, the pandemic have been lower, uh, and we've had a pretty good a pretty good uh, track record now of basically surfing the waves with the increase activity. As of today, the prevalence rate percent positive of samples taken fell to 8.66, which is just a tremendous drop when you think back that really just two weeks ago we were 30 percent. So uh, what we're seeing is this peak uh, at 30 percent, which really reflected the infectivity of this virus, a very infectious virus, but because we're so well vaccinated and because now the virus has very limited places to go because people have either had it or been vaccinated and had it or been vaccinated, boosted and have it, uh, the virus has no place to go. So we're doing terrific in Howard County. Um, my patients and I think uh, my friends, my family, everybody's tired. Everybody is so tired. And so this is welcome news uh, about the mask mandate. Nevertheless, I suspect that for the, for the, for the, uh, in the near future, people are still gonna be wearing masks. And, and, and if you're out and about and you don't know who's out there, it's a promotional thing to say, I care about you and you care about me, so we're wearing masks. Um, and the mask is effective. Uh, and uh, of course, I'm always counseling people, um, if, you, if you do get a respiratory illness, it's, it's COVID until proven otherwise. So you need to isolate, and then we need to decide whether you need to get tested or just stay put for five days. Uh, but the overwhelming thing to speak to what Dan said is people are tired, they have anxiety. Uh, this has been a very, very dark time for many people, but I'm really optimistic as we go further and further into spring that we're gonna blossom. I love the optimism. We need it. Um, so we do have one question coming in anonymously. Is there any definitive guidance on if and when a second booster will be necessary? Dr. Rossman, we'll start with you on that. So if and when a second booster might be necessary. Well, I would love to be definitive, but I, I, I'm not able to do so. You know, so one of the things we've learned over the past few years is that we're living, you know, we're just in time learning about the COVID uh, and, and vaccines. Um, I suspect that over time, we will develop uh, or redevelop the vaccines um, similar to maybe, similar but different, how we do influenza vaccine, try to matching with variants. We knew, you know, COVID vaccine, or, or we didn't know, but over the past two years, we've learned that variants emerge. Uh, we even now have a variant from Omicron. Um, and trying to keep up with the pace of the variants and vaccines is challenging. Um, I'm optimistic as Dr. Oaken is that spring is a harbinger of uh, positive living, um, but I suspect that maybe we will get into a cycle, maybe in, in winter, at least in the Northeast, where Omicron where we will um, uh, emerge once again, and we have to sort of either get vaccinated or boosted again, whatever that may look like, wear our masks if that's necessary. Um, and so it's all a learning and living experience. And I think last today, what I'd like to say to, to those that are participating and then listening later is that we're in a transitional period, right? We've been living with the pandemic, uh, treating it almost like a, a, or as a crisis as it is and recognizing that, um, uh, that COVID is not going away. So what must we do to resume life? Maybe not exactly the way it was two years ago, but in a way that is manageable and creating less anxiety, less, less stress. And what are those things that we must do to overcome this? Yeah, and if I could just um, add a few things. So the, about the booster. So it's it's really all about the science. And we, we really don't know yet. Uh, do we need a third booster? Do we need a fourth booster? What will it be? One of the interesting things that, that's emerging is that we, what we've learned about the three vaccines we have, which would depend on mRNA, is that it's not 100% clear that they will be the boost, they will be the vaccine of the future. So we're we're going to be entering very soon 2.0 vaccines, which may be more durable uh, and may, be, may, may have a wider, a wider immune effect. And I think that's right, we're right on the future of seeing that happen. And that, that's a very positive thing. And as Dr. Rossman said, 
we're stuck with coronavirus. Hopefully we're not stuck with waves and waves of, a, of, a, of, a, uh, of outbreaks. Hopefully it's going, to cre it's going to be at a low level and during certain times of the year, it will pop up and we'll have to take our action and then it'll, it'll, it'll be nailed down again. So we're stuck with it, at least for the next three to five years, I'm pretty sure. And the vaccines that we'll then have perhaps in the, in the uh, fall might be a combination um, coronavirus plus flu vaccine. And here's, a, here's something about the flu. You know, we were always expecting the worst with the flu and maybe there was gonna be a flu, a flu epidemic again this year. Fortunately, flu activity has remained low. Uh, so that didn't complicate things again this year. I think it remained low because people have learned about hand washing, about face masking, about not going out and exposing other people when you don't feel well. So I think as a population, we've actually learned in some ways how to contain infectious illnesses. Influenza is not as infectious as Omicron, but it is infectious. Yeah, it was easy to kind of forget about flu a little bit, I think, there for a while. So a um, couple of questions here about uh, our children and how we should be expecting to handle this um, now endemic, I suppose, as we move into it. But one question about vaccination and vaccine availability for kids under five and the encouragement of parents to vaccinate their kids. And then another one that I want to make sure we're careful about, but asking about masks in school and when can that change to be masking by choice in school. So Dr. Oaken, maybe um, if you could start with some uh, your thoughts on vaccine availability for kids under five and we can talk a little bit more about what the school might be dealing with here decision wise. Right. Sure. Well, as everyone knows right now, uh, currently five and over can be vaccinated, but I'm not certain that two to five has been approved. It's on the cusp of being approved. Is, isn't that correct, Mar? Yeah. So uh, Pfizer just submitted uh, their study data right. and they're reviewing that and uh, they're hoping for emergency authorization of a two dose series, understanding that probably the three dose series uh, is what ultimately will be needed. Right. Right, so I, I think we have to wait for that emergency utilization to know uh, how to uh, respond to that. Um, but it obviously is going to be a, a hot topic. So Danica, first uh, full disclosure to the group that's listening. Um, they may not have picked up on it. I'm a pediatrician, I'm a vaccine believer. I think these mRNA vaccines that Warp Speed brought to us within a year is a miracle and life-saving. And I think I've discussed it before. I'm of a certain age. When I went through my medical training, uh, I took care of children who didn't make it through the ICU uh, due to vaccine preventable diseases now. Uh, deaths that current residents in pediatrics no longer see, including varicella, chickenpox, because of vaccines. So full disclosure, proponent of vaccines. <laughs> I can't wait. <laughs> uh, should um, the FDA thoroughly, which they will, and CDC review the studies from uh, Pfizer, and if in fact these vaccines are effective, which at least preliminarily the two dose doesn't seem quite effective, that we need a third dose. So I'm a little worried that there may be confusion about communication if we authorize a two dose series only knowing that it's really a three dose. But parents, they're used to three doses of vaccinating our children. The way out of this pandemic, endemic safety is in my opinion, again, full disclosure, vaccine. Um, we do know from the uptake of the five to 11 year olds that there is more hesitancy among parents to vaccinate their five to 11 year olds as a parent, I understand wanting to protect the youngest children, um, but as a pediatrician and a parent who vaccinated her children, uh, I recognize the importance and I hope that uh, all parents out there, grandparents who are listening, really seek credible information about the efficacy and benefits and risks of vaccinating their children. Um, the based on information today, which obviously could change that uh, the FDA CDC may uh, authorize vaccine for the, the, the two to five, two to four year olds actually, um, as early as uh, four to six weeks. So I applaud that. 
Um, but also recognize that every parent should be thinking carefully about that decision and hopefully considering, I'm going to say, evidence-based credible information in terms of weighing that vac vaccination process for their children. And piggybacking off of that, Dr. Rossman, can you talk at all about the conversations you have with the school system, how challenging those are, especially when it comes to the mass mandates? I think kids and parents alike are ready to rip on themselves <laughs> um, as soon as possible. But, you know, what are those conversations look like and what considerations are a little different than the decision that was made today? Yeah, so um, so we are, the health department works really uh, in partnership with Howard County Public School, as do all our organizations. The health department is committed to all, you know, 325,000 Howard County residents. Um, currently, we continue to recommend universal masking in schools and, pre and preschools uh, for children ages two and up. And why is that? And why is that different than adults? One, in schools, it's really difficult right now to physically distance. We are still in a transmission range of high in the state of Maryland. So, and as Dr. Oaken mentioned, this is a very highly transmissible disease. We are peaking in terms of our mortality. More people have died for this wave than in the previous wave. So um, in looking at schools and the, the layered approaches, given that in many classrooms, kids are unable to physically distance, masking remains, again, in my opinion, a cheap, easy, and relatively harmless, given I get the emotional distress for some of wearing a mask all the time. But it is something that I hope that we need to do at least for the next four weeks. You know, who was it? Puxatorty Phil better come out and say that like spring is coming, right? Because with warmer weather, we know, Omer we know COVID, Omicron doesn't like that. So please stick with us for four more weeks. Wear your masks. The kids do fine with it. Um, and we will get through this. I think we have some relative guides to help us too. As the prevalence gets lower and lower, uh, we're going to feel more and more comfortable about people going out and you know doing things socially. And one point uh, that Dr. Rossman made about the mortality. So yeah, we've seen more deaths during this wave than we have previously. Part of that actually has to do with just the vast numbers of people that have been infected. Um, and uh, and interestingly. Vaccine, this vaccine, the mRNA vaccines that we have as, as our primary weapon, they really, really work. I mean, one of the scientific facts that we can say about this vaccine is that if you've gotten fully vaccinated, you are 10 times less likely to be hospitalized, need oxygen, go on a ventilator, or die. And just recently, University of Maryland released some information, which I thought was very interesting, and it went along the lines of this. Uh, of all the people that have been admitted over the last 30 days, about 74% of them of the admitted COVID infections had not been vaccinated. 22% of them had been vaccinated but not boosted and only about 3% of them had been boosted. So I mean, that, there's a lot of information there about how valuable these vaccines have been. And they're really, I mean, last January when it became available to the general public, it was a game changer. It was a real game changer. And uh, I think, honestly, I think the scientists that developed these, the vaccine went beyond their expectations of how, uh, of what a great utility they were to this pandemic for us. Absolutely. I want to double, I want to double down. Sorry, I want Dr. Do it. Go Go ahead. <laughs> Get boosted. <laughs> Now, it's really important. I think we should consider this a three-dose vaccine. Getting boosted is really important to preventing the severity of disease, hospitalizations, and mortality. If you haven't gotten boosted, get boosted tomorrow. Now, I don't know if you'll agree with me, Mara, but I, I feel like if you've been fully vaccinated and you happen to get Omicron before you got your boost, you probably don't need to be boosted now. 
Uh, well, time will tell with the variants, yeah, right? Time will I don't tell. think I, I think there's no harm in getting the third shot. You know, once you feel well, like all vaccines, so I wouldn't hesitate to go out there and get boosted when you can. We I don't do want know to roll that the, the I don't want to roll the right. dice. I don't want to wind up in the hospital. We do know that getting the natural infection causes a rather brisk, immediate antibody rise, but it's maybe not sustainable. We just don't know yet. We just and we do know, know that boosting is more lasts longer the vaccine than natural immunity. All right. Um, so moving on quickly to because we've got quite a few questions here. So Jonathan was wondering, aren't you all concerned about another spike in COVID cases if suddenly everybody drops this mask mandate? So maybe Dr. Oaken, start there. Well, as as Dr. Rossman said, there is son of Omicron that's uh, now been um, been um, discovered in about 17 states and about 49 countries in the world. It's called the BA.2. So this is thought to be one and a half times more likely to be transmissible than the original Omicron. So, you know, what does that mean? Is there going to be a wave? If you had Omicron one, are you immune to Omicron two? We don't know. Uh, so it's not over, but it's better. And I think that's what we can say right now. Yeah, and I'll add from a public health perspective, please public don't confuse a mask mandate with the recommendation to wear a mask. So right. public health says right now we're in high transmission, wear your mask. The question really is, do you need government to tell you to wear your mask? I am uh, trustful that Howard County residents know how to follow the science as Dr. Oaken mentioned, and don't need the county executive to tell you or mandate you to wear your mask. Dr. Oaken, you just mentioned something that was the next question about B, uh, B.2, uh, BA.2, excuse me, and the fact that it is spreading quicker. And um, this anonymous attendee was wondering whether or not the variant has been detected in Howard County. Any concerns in particular with that moving forward? So I, I don't have the information locally, uh, I, but I do know before this webcast, I, I checked to see how how often, it, it, where, what states it's been, uh, or how many states it's been present in. It's what I just have the up-to-date information, 17 states, 49 countries. That's what I know. Um, so just to add, I do know that it's been detected in, the, in Maryland. I'm not aware that it's been detected in uh, Howard County, but I suspect it's certainly present in Howard County. It just means we, we haven't uh, done the laboratory data or have the ability to do the analysis to prove that. Outside of it being um, just as contagious, Dr. Rossman, or even or even more so, spreading quicker, is there anything else about this variant that we know yet that you're particularly concerned about, optimistic about? Yeah, I, I wish I had more information, right? I wish I had more data, but uh, that's we've been living through that uh, for the past two years, right? Um, so, <laughs> so yeah, I mean. I'm hoping that, you know, I'm hearing that maybe it's more transmissible. I'm hearing that it's not any more severe than Omicron B1. Um, I'm hoping that I'm um, hearing that the vaccines are equally um, efficacious as well as the treatments. So um, it may spread quicker, but I'm hoping it will also burn out quicker. Very good. Um, Andrea has a question, kind of going back to our initial conversation with all of this, and Dr. Oaken, I'll pose this to you first. Would you like to encourage people to increase healthy habits, to boost the immune, immune system, cut down on processed foods, uh, eat more fruits and veggies? What about vitamin D supplements? Um, are They seem to be effective according to what right. she has found. Can you fill us in on your, um, your perspective on all of that? And then we'll give Dr. Rossman a chance as well. So, uh, all of those things are important. You know, we talk about the four pillars of, of a healthy immune system, good nutrition, restorative sleep, control of stress, and exercise. As far as sleep goes, we know if you, if you miss, if you don't get your good sleep, the sweet spot for most people is six to eight hours. We know if we measure T cell and B cell activity, these immune warriors that we have, you'll see a 20 to 30% drop in their efficiency if you don't, if you only get four hours of sleep instead of six to eight. Sleep's so important. We know that if you do too much exercise or not enough exercise, it affects your immune system. 
We know if you get the right amount of exercise, it makes your B cell function, which is how we make antibodies, it makes your T cell function uh, much better. So all of these healthy habits really, really come together to hold up this platform that we call the immune system. And when any one of those four things is not balanced, it tips and we're vulnerable. Concerning vitamin D. So the studies tell us that if you're vitamin D deficient, particularly for influenza, that you're more susceptible. So that doesn't necessarily mean that taking vitamin D is gonna be helpful, but most people don't get enough vitamin D. So I'm a proponent and I ask my patients to consider taking at least 2000 units of vitamin D3 every day, trying to keep their vitamin D levels at least at 30 if they're measured, 40 or 50 is probably better. Dr. Rossman, anything to add to the healthy habits? Yeah, take your vitamin D, especially in these dark times of February. I certainly do. Um, this is just an important time to remember to take care of ourselves and be kind and be compassionate. I mean, it's been a rough two years, right? <laughs> and we keep hoping. So, um, you know, back when Dan said exercise is really important. And exercise can be, as he think he was saying, different for each person. Some people really do well at the gym. Some people just do well in their backyard. And, you know, some may have equipment in their house. So get up and move, really important. Good nutrition, eat well, eat healthy. And yes, you know, vitamin D and other attributes recommended by vitamins or medical treatments recommend, recommend, ugh, recommended by your provider, also critically important. Um, I'll just say personally, you know, I used to go to the gym. I was a triathlete. COVID happened. I quit the gym, didn't go. One of the things that inspires me, and that's what I think all of us need to find, whatever that button is, is the Olympics. The Olympics is starting these gorgeous, beautiful athletes who commit themselves. And for me, that's another um, opportunity to get literally back on the bike. Um, and a reminder that I need to be kind to myself, even though I feel shameful that I've been not doing much for, for the past two years, I hopefully have the next 20 years to recoup what I've been doing. So find what that passion is, what you're willing to do, get moving, take care of yourself, eat well, cook with friends, and listen to your doctor. Movement matters. We love it over here. Um, <laughs> Um, an anonymous um, participant was wondering about the percentage of COVID hospitalizations and deaths that are due to COVID. We hear this a lot, due to COVID versus incidental COVID. Could um, you kind of, Dr. Rossman, we'll start with you this time if you could touch on that. Yeah, and I'm so sorry. I don't have that data. Um, there was a, a whoa, when was it? Maybe two months ago now, a security issue with the, the Maryland Department of Health. And I don't have that level of hospital data not trying to go around it. I just don't have that, that level of data. Yeah, this is a confusing issue. Uh, and a lot of people have used this to say that, um, that uh, the hospitalization is falsely elevated because so many people are coming in and being incidentally told that they're COVID positive when they're actually not being admitted for that. But that is gonna be important data to find out. I would say in our area, uh, in, in Howard County, people get admitted for COVID they have COVID. If they're COVID positive, they have COVID. That's the, that's the large number of people that when we hospitalize them in our community, they're not just COVID positive, they're sick with COVID. So somebody else was wondering or going back to vaccines a little bit here, but the mRNA uh, vaccine and the side effect of myocarditis and hearing that it can be very serious, especially for teenage and adult men. Dr. Oaken, anything to well, this, this is a signal that has showed up, particularly for adolescent males. And uh, people are looking at this and studying this. You know, in other countries, um, I know in the Netherlands, uh, they are not giving uh, the Moderna vaccine to um, uh, males under 30. Uh, so there is definitely a signal that has showed up. Don't forget, though, that COVID itself can cause myocarditis. So... Again, we have to go back to the science, weigh the risks and benefits for when we decide to get vaccinated and who to get vaccinated. So um, if you have an adolescent young male who may have had 
a, a, a vaccine, um, may have had both vaccines and fully vaccinated, and uh, then you're talking about boostering them, I think there's reasonable discussion that can happen. Should I really give my 18-year-old male patient a booster? And there's some pushback, and we just don't have the data just yet to, to have a, a great definitive answer. So it's ongoing discussions. And concerning that, actually, just to go a little further, uh, as I mentioned, you know, vaccine 2.0 is just about here. There are a number of vaccines, one in particular, which is called a subunit vaccine, which just yesterday uh, filed for emergency utilization approval in, in the United States. It's now being used in over 170 countries in the world. Uh, this vaccine is actually made by a vaccine maker in Bethesda. Uh, and um, one of the things that uh, has come up is they, they actually published their results in the New England Journal, about 30,000 uh, patients, uh, I think it was in December, where they looked at the efficacy of this vaccine as a subunit vaccine. It was very efficacious, over 90% effective, and did not have that signal of myocarditis with this particular vaccine. So, you know, as we go forward, we're making improvements, we're finding new ways, and I fully expect that our vaccination of the future will be possibly mRNA, but possibly other, other types of vaccines as well. Dr. Rossman, anything to add on that topic? No, I, I think Dr. Oaken did, did a great job. I think uh, certainly in my opinion, no question about anyone, uh, young males uh, who the myocarditis issue has been raised in getting the first two doses. And the question really is the risk benefit of the third dose, given that uh, most younger people don't have significant disease. I can only add that I had a 29-year-old male. He got boosted. Got it. Dr. Rossman, Frank is a cruiser. He says he's a big cruiser. He is looking forward to going back on his cruise ships. There are other folks wondering about restaurants and when we can feel really comfortable about that. Uh, you know, I know I'm ca we're casting a kind of a wide net here, but you know, we're starting to think about traveling, eating out, doing those kind of normal things again. Um, what is your take? considering oh, all things me, right now. Me too, right? That's all part of my, me getting through my day. What's my next trip? Now I have to say, you know, one of the things uh, my husband and I is having two adult children enjoy going uh, traveling. And certainly our travel has been a bit curtailed to say the least with uh, COVID. Um, however, that being said, um, all of us have different uh, risks benefits to weigh with whom we live, uh, their, their um, risk uh, of COVID and what that may mean. Um, so when I weigh things, right, I look at the risk benefit. If I have a family wedding, and we did have a family wedding. Um, uh, it was in the summer. It was low COVID times. So it was like, sh mm, like, should we do this or not? Um, and then you have to look at what the bigger picture is and the risk at that time. Um, Right now, I really don't venture too much in indoor restaurants, but I'm, um, I'm beginning to. I went to an event in a private room in a restaurant here in Howard County with uh, three other couples who were vaccinated, and I'm so glad we were able to get together. Large cruise ships, me personally, make me nervous at this point. That's just me. Um, and so again, it's risk benefit. I'm really hoping that the spring and summer will look different, um, which makes planning difficult, right? Because I know when you book your trip, you're booking it now, um, get travel insurance. Um, but I think we should begin to think about venturing out and what that looks like. And it may look a little different for each of us and that's okay. Yeah, exactly. exactly. I think <clears throat> trying to define what the risk is, low, medium, and high, and what you're willing to do is something I talk to my patients about all the time. I, I totally agree with you, Mara. This isn't making the list right now, but I do want to throw it out there to you both. You know, I think what we're skirting around here is the, the concept of trade-offs right now, and that it's becoming more and more um, real and more and more obvious that this pandemic and staying isolated while evading one risk has come with another. And, you know, any advice, Dr. Oaken, for how we should be 
looking at that now that we're in this new transitional phase of all of this and how we should be considering all of that and, and what you think about when you make those decisions? Well, first, every day for the last week or two, I've become increasingly optimistic because I follow that prevalence number very, very closely. And every day, that prevalence number is going further and further down. Now, some people have thought that actually Omicron uh, is going to be the salvation to all of our problems. I don't really agree with that, but I agree that Omicron has caused so many people to get infected that probably has improved awareness of what's going on and also given some transient natural immunity on top of booster and vaccine immunity. So I'm actually, uh, as we get closer and closer to the spring, getting more and more optimistic, and I actually see and I predict that by really March, things are going to be significantly better. Once the prevalence rate goes less than 5%, I think uh, we'll probably hear, I hope from our public health officials, you know, we can relax a little bit and feel a little bit better. If people remember what was going on in June when the prevalence was much less than 5%, we were as close as back to normal as we, as we have been in the last two years. And that was a really great feeling. Of course, we had warm weather. We could get outside and, and, and dine. We could get outside and do things. But I, I'm just, I, I know how heavy a burden this is on people's backs. And I, I really feel, however, we're just at the cusp of significant relief. It's just right around the corner. We've, you've heard that before, of course, but I think this time is different. I want to add that we also have a few more tools in our toolbox, right? We've, we've spent a lot of time talking tonight about vaccination, which go get boosted. Um, but we also have um, better testing than we've had even the last time we spoke. So, you know, in terms of what people can do to minimize their risk, well, we now have home kits and there are certainly uh, drawbacks to them. They're not perfect. But when used in a certain manner, it can help us make decisions about, do I go to that wedding? Do I go visit grandma? Do I wanna go on that cruise ship? Um, and we also have um, more capacity for the gold standard PCR kits and lab turnaround times. I know there was a total glitch uh, with the high volumes during the holidays. So we have to develop ourselves how to use these tools that we can keep in our kitchen cabinets and our bathroom cabinets to minimize our risk if that's what our goal is. And masks, we can still use masks to minimize risk in certain settings and the, the settings will be different, indoors, outdoors, warm, cold, crowded settings or not. So I think we're gonna get better at using our tools to uh, manage through the, um, the, the uh, let's say COVID as it becomes more endemic and more predictable. We, we, we also have some- Oh, go yeah, ahead, we, Dr. Oaken, I'm sorry. <laughs> I was just gonna say to add to those tools, we have some therapeutics, which we didn't exactly. have. Exactly, yep. And um, you know, we have our monoclonal antibody. Now, of course, for Omicron, we had to use, we had to use one specific type of antibody, uh, which was in short supply for a period of time. I think we're back up and running though. Um, and, we also have two oral, oral drugs, which we actually can get in Howard County. Uh, it's a little bit of a hassle, but we can get them uh, for people that we think are high risk. And then on the, on the horizon are some really interesting scientific studies which show us that some repurposed drugs that have been available for a while can be used uh, to decrease the likelihood of hospitalization. Uh, so lots and lots of great technology out there that's emerging and we're in a much better place with these tools and with these therapeutics and of course with the vaccines. Excellent, thank you. My apologies for interrupting there, Dr. Oaken. So speaking of masks though, one of those tools in our toolbox, Stephanie was wondering about preschool kids and they're not wearing N95s, they're wearing cloth masks. Um, does it make sense to mask kids that young? Dr. Oaken, if you wanna take that first. I'm gonna give that to Dr. <laughs> Dr. <Nice. Rossman. laughs> She's a pediatrician. <laughs> yeah, so, so kids two and up can be masked. Um, you know, I know there's a lot of talk the past two weeks about respirator type masks, the N95s, KN95s. 
uh, which were developed for healthcare workers. And if anyone's worn an N95, they're tough. <laughs> I'm a good mask wearer. Six hours of wearing an N95, it, it's fatiguing. So what I tell people, wear the highest quality mask that's comfortable for you and you can wear reliably. I really, you know, there's really no uh, um, standardized N95s and KN95s that are, that are manufactured for children. Just keep that in mind. <laughs> so for your kids, wear the best high quality mask that they can. And, and basically what that means for me, um, surgical masks are, my, are the first thing to start with. If you can find a KN95 that, that you or your child can wear, wear that. If you can wear an N95 for a, a significant period of time, good. Uh, my least favorable are the cloth masks at this point. There are really studies have shown they're not as effective as the surgical masks, which are really quite comfortable and cheap and you don't have to wash. That's a good point. Um, going back to boosters, and we're jumping around a little bit here, but just going by the questions, um, someone was wondering about uh, folks who have gotten sick with COVID that received their booster, and whether or not we have a latest percentage on that. You know, this person said, based on all of the people I know, it can't be a small percentage of boosted individuals who still get COVID and spread it to others. I'm thinking that boosters may be protective against hospitalization and death but not necessarily to spread the virus to others. So Dr. Rossman, would you like to address that? Yeah, and I don't have the exact percentages, but as, as the, the person who wrote in, right, breakthrough infection is real, uh, even among persons who are boosted. But as Do Dr. Oaken pointed out, persons who wind up in the hospital and who ultimately die and on, on respirators and die, there's a progression there. Uh, are far, far, far less likely to have been boosted and have completed their series. So although the percentage of folks, and I haven't seen it again because of the data issue, and I'm not trying to not share it, um, although the percentage of people boosted getting infected anyway uh, is higher than probably what we would like, the percentage of people with serious illness is relatively speaking quite low compared to not being vaccinated and not being boosted. Yeah, there's some, there's some great data out there just about the value of vaccination. And here's one statistic I came across just the other day. If you were fully vaccinated, and this didn't include being boosted, but if you were fully vaccinated, your likelihood of uh, death was one out of, actually your likelihood of hospitalization and or death was one out of 26,000 That if you, got, if you got sick. Those are pretty good odds to take to the bank about why it's so important to be vaccinated. And there's still a reasonable handful of people, even in Howard County, that are not vaccinated. So, you know, we continue to push this. It's so important. Absolutely. Going back to masks, Howard was wondering how often KN95 masks should be replaced. Uh, that's a great question. Um, it really has to do with how often the user wears it, if it gets wet, if it gets dirty. So anytime that it becomes dirty or um, moisture, you sneeze into it, then you need to change it up. Uh, also, how well it fits. Um, uh, these are straps, right? Um, the straps stretch. Um, so when they the stretch, st straps stretch such that it's no longer really adhering to your face, time to get a new one. So they could last a week for some people. I think that's a little long. My bet for most people, three days. Um, but it, again, it depends on uh, the environment with which you're wearing it. And if you're the kid stretching it and whatever, <laughs> we all know how that goes. Absolutely. So we're um, coming up on the one hour mark. And again, I want to be respectful of everyone's times. The questions are kind of um, dwindling off here. So. Um, I'm going to try to wrap one up here, uh, and it's it's a big one, but somebody was wondering, you know, even in our conversation tonight, we're saying based on science, the mask mandate has been lifted, no mask, the doctors, you know, you two have been saying, you know, wear a mask, though, we should wear that presumably based on science, and then masks work, and he's seen articles, or um, he or she has seen articles that masks don't work. It's a little confusing. We know that it can get confusing. So at the end of the day, 
what the heck should we do is the question. And I know it's a big one, but Dr. Oaken, I'm going to put you on the spot and have you take the first stab. Well, my general advice to everybody right now is number one, get vaccinated. Um, number two, uh, I try to avoid and tell my patients to avoid uh, indoor areas which, which which are crowded. Okay, so there's your, and if you are in an indoor area that's crowded, definitely be masked. So I'm a big advocate of masking in indoor areas where it's crowded. I'm a big advocate in trying to get everybody that I can to get at least primary vaccination. We can always have a discussion about the booster. I'm for boosters. I was for booster. I, I began to be very, very for booster once I saw that Omicron surge uh, back in November. Uh, so boosted, um, vaccinated, and masked in indoor areas where there's crowds. I'm going to say ditto to what Dr. Oaken said, but um, I, again, I'm going to repeat what I think maybe I tried to say before and wasn't uh, successful. Uh, the recommendations from public health and from medical professionals to wear your mask while we're in such a uh, high transmission zone uh, remains. The real question is whether or not we need the government to tell us to wear our mask. And this may not resonate. The government doesn't mandate that we wear shoes and a shirt when we enter a restaurant. The restaurant may require that, but we know the social norms of going to a restaurant that we wear a shirt and we wear shoes. What shirt we choose to wear is up to us, right? And what, and what shoes. So we all know, or I'm gonna say, wearing a mask right now with high transmission is what you should do. Whether or not we need the county executor or government to tell us that is really the question. And that's a policy decision that shouldn't be confused with the medical decision and health decision about wearing a mask when we have such a high transmissible virus in our community. Awesome, so I wanna give you both an opportunity as we wrap up here to just share anything that maybe wasn't asked tonight that you want to make sure is mentioned any you know we we ended this or excuse me we started this conversation on kind of a, a hopeful high note of, of kind of being optimistic so if there's any more points of that to share um just just anything that we haven't gotten to yet tonight that you think is important to remember as we head into the even next stage of all of this um here in february of 2022 <laughs> I just want to thank CA for inviting us. Um, and, um, you know, February can be a dark month. It's cold, literally dark. Um, and so I hope everyone um, just takes care of themselves, is compassionate to others, kind to yourself. And again, um, regardless of what you are hearing, please take the time to reach out to credible resources. Um, believe in science, believe in the facts. Or if you're not sure what to believe in, reach out to Dr. Oaken or your provider and try to find out um, the best truth that you can. And those are those are great, great thoughts and, and good wisdom, Mara. And let me just add what this pandemic has taught me as a clinician uh, is that when it first started, we thought we knew what was happening. And every day we learned something differently, something more, something something deeper. And as the pandemic developed, we became really, I think, humbled by what we didn't know. And then we had to make decisions based on what we knew at the time. Sometimes we were right, sometimes we were wrong. This pandemic has taught me as a clinician uh, uh, just an, imme an, an, an immense amount of, of, uh, uh, of of things that uh, that I never really thought that I would encounter in my clinical practice, uh, it taught me actually um, how how important it is to use science to make good decisions, and that based on the science, things can change minute to minute, hour to hour, day to day. We've learned so much about how to take care of patients and how to keep patients going. When we in the beginning of the pandemic, uh, people were dying left and right on ventilators, not on ventilators. We learned all about vac vaccines. I know more about vaccines today than I've ever known, that, thanks to the pandemic. So um, the, big, the big issue, uh, the, the big learning lesson for me is 
how humbling it was to be faced with this pandemic of monstrous proportions and to take the information, make good decisions and move on. And I really do think that the future is bright for us to emerge uh, stronger, better, and more prepared for the next time. Those are wonderful words to wrap up on here and give everybody back a couple minutes of their evening as well. I just want to thank everybody for their time. Um, I know personally as well, this has been, um, as Dr. Oaken so eloquently put it, a very humbling time and uh, you really uh, learn a lot of things that you didn't think any kind of illness could teach you. So we appreciate um, all of uh, your valuable time. And as Dr. Rossman said, I will echo, please, please be kind to yourself. Please get out and move. Movement is medicine, movement matters, and we all need to do it uh, right now, probably more than ever. Um, so thank you all. This will be again posted on CA's YouTube page if you wanna revisit any of these comments, any of this feedback, any of this expertise. Again, thank you to Dr. Oaken, Dr. Rossman, and to Dan Burns for coming out tonight. We appreciate all of your time. Um, please stay safe, please stay healthy and have a wonderful evening. Thank you so much. Thanks for doing this. Good night.